Welcome to the Communication 24-7 podcast, where we communicate about how we communicate. I'm your host, Jennifer Furlong. So we have a treat today. I am so excited about this topic. Y'all don't even know. One of the things that I love to talk about, conflict management, conflict resolution. You know, my daytime job as a media analyst, I love to lean in and talk about the tough stuff. But many of us are really hesitant to dive into that. So I have a very special guest with me today. She is a master mediator. She's a negotiator and author. We're going to talk about her book, which is an amazing book. I'm going to encourage everybody to pick it up. And she has traveled around the world talking to different audiences about conflict resolution. So get your notepads out. Take good notes because I know we are going to learn a lot during this episode. Hesha, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. How are you doing? My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all for listening. Everyone taking time out of their day. We know there's so many demands on your time. And the fact you want to listen to this and make your life more harmonious and less acrimonious, go you. That sounds wonderful, right? Who doesn't want that? But it's kind of hard getting to that. (laughs) We need to be able to get to that next step. So I know the audience is really excited to hear what you have to say about this particular topic that we're talking about today. But before we get to that, would you mind sharing with us what's your origin story? Like, What made you want to go into this particular field? Because it's not usual to find someone who really enjoys engaging in these types of difficult conversations. So tell us about that. Indeed. Well, I'm a lawyer and I've been a lawyer for, you know, 35 years already. And back in the day, you know, when you were a young woman and I had children, you couldn't do hard level intense work and be a mother, childcare. It was a constant source of difficulty. And I was doing really high level trial work. And I found out about this thing called mediation. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You talk to people for a living? You solve problems? You work out deals? And then I could control it on my own schedule. So I was a hard litigator for about five years. So I have that background in me so that when I talk with litigators, I don't come at this in a kumbaya, airy-fairy, win-win problem solving. Let's all be friendly and talk to each other because that's not the real world. You know, that works, what, 10% of the time? Okay, for those 10%, 15% even, that's great. What about the other 85? When it's somebody that you think is an idiot or a narcissist or evil or stupid or power hungry or immature or fill in the blank, that's real life. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I can go into a situation that's so intense and so hard, and I can help people work out a deal. And sometimes it's a cold piece. We just get a deal done. That's fine. Sometimes you get every once in a great while, you get rewarded with one of those tiny little kumbaya moments, but it's very, very rare. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book is that I know tricks. I know tools that our listeners can do today. You don't need a master's course. You don't need some big MBA and something. What can you do today in difficult situations that diffuse the tension. And that's why I call the book The Secret to Resolving Conflict and Diffusing Tension, because 100% of conflict, 100% of it starts with tension. And the tension can be, or it can be, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. And I have an analogy that I'll, I want to, I know it's a long answer to a very short question, but I'll give you just one quick analogy because people think and remember by analogies. So we've all dropped uh, spaghetti sauce on the counter or teriyaki sauce or barbecue sauce, right? You take a wet sponge, you wipe it up. It's no big deal. You leave it overnight. You're scraping it off of the spatula. Mm. Three or four months or three or four years, and it is old and moldy and nasty. And that, my friends, is conflict. Mm. And we all 
intuitively know that. So why don't we wipe it up with a sponge when it's wet? Well, I'm afraid of you, Jen. I'm afraid of what you'll say to me or you won't say to me or how it'll react or what I'll have to deal with. Or Oh, God, can it just go away? And unfortunately, my friends, it never goes away. Mm -hmm. Doors like nuts for the winter. So one of the reason I wrote this simple, easy little book is how do you wipe it up when it's wet? You know, let's say you don't. Okay, there's plenty of advanced stuff in there too. But there's a lot of the basic stuff of how do I wipe it up when it's wet so it doesn't become ugly and doesn't become nasty. That's right. I love that analogy. It was making me think of, you know, if it's sitting there longer and longer, and like you said, it can it can mold, it can, it can mildew, it can stain whatever surface it's laying on. And so that stain right there, it's, you know, in some instances it's permanent. Yeah. So, and, and that's really tragic. If we let something sit for so long, it seems like there's no going back. There's, it gets to a point where maybe there's nothing that we can do to resolve that conflict. So I'd, I'd like to talk about that type of conflict maybe a little later on, but something right. that you said that piqued my interest is, you know, let's wipe it up with a sponge, a wet sponge now before it gets to that point. So many people though are really hesitant to have a conversation about something, yeah. even if it's just the slightest little thing. What is it that you've learned about people that why are we not willing to bring something up to somebody else? What's going on there that that it's so difficult for us to even get started in this? Fear, fear. And the fear is not foolish. The fear is well-placed because, you know, we're all adults. So we were all children and you experimented with things and you got whacked down hard or you got rejected or you got betrayed or you got abandoned. No one escapes this life unscathed. Nobody. So we all have had those experiences. And by the time we're in adulthood, we figured out, all right, this is my MO, right? This is how my modus operandi. This is how I'm going to operate. This is safe. This works. You want me to try something new? What are you, crazy? Why would I do that? This works. And so the question I have for our listeners is, does it really work? Or does it only work in a quarter of the time? or less than half the time. And what does it cost you? So again, another analogy is as if we are cavemen and cave women, and we're just shoving food in our mouths. Well, here's a fork, here's a spoon, here's a knife, here's chopsticks. What's going to work best for you? And you want to make something easy because I don't, again, I am not kumbaya. I mean, my work is real. You have to get and deal with real stuff all day, every day. And when it's real, there's a lot of fear. And the fear can also inhibit your skill set development to try to do something. And so if people want magic beans, a magic thing you could do right now, it's curiosity. That is the number one thing you can do. And yet that's really hard because if you say something that is so stupid or so selfish or so power grabby or so fill in the blank, it's very hard for me to go, well, I'm just going to be curious now about you. Yeah. Because your amygdala, which is the fear and negativity center in the brain, gets triggered. And that's one of the reasons I call the book Holding the Calm is because that's the mantra I use for myself. I have an amygdala. I just have a very, very long wick because I've had 35 years in the trenches of human conflict to actually practice what works. I'm sort of like a, a doctor of humanity. Um, but I can get hangry. I can get tired. I can get you know, I'm a normal person like everybody else. And I give myself grace. And so the trick is I say to myself, I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. That took two seconds. And so our listeners are probably saying, well, what's the difference between saying, uh, take a deep breath or calm down. And if there's one takeaway for this talk, for everybody listening to me, eliminate those words from your vocabulary, eliminate them. Never, ever, ever, ever tell somebody to calm down or take a deep breath. And the reason why is if a person's amygdala is triggered, anytime you're upset, annoyed, bothered, frightened, scared, your amygdala is triggered. Any, every single time, the amygdala feels powerless. So what does a person do when they feel powerless? They grab power any way they can, even inappropriately. 
even wrongly, even selfishly or unfairly. That's what they will do. And when you say to somebody, whoa, you are out of control. Take a deep breath. Calm down. All you're doing is exacerbating that sense of powerlessness. So the first thing you do is you get power. So if I'm feeling powerless, I'm going to give myself power. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. In that two seconds, it says to my amygdala, oh, girlfriend, you have tools. You've got some tricks up your sleeve. How do you want to handle this? That calms me down 75%. Now I can think. Now I can decide what I want to do. It also works if I do that for somebody else. So you and I've had this talk. So we're friends, something happens. I can say, Jen, you want me to hold the calm with you? You can either go, no, I got it. Or you're going to go, oh, yes, please, God. Okay. Let's say you have no idea what holding the calm is. So you can't really say that to somebody. When I may look to you and say, you seem very frustrated. How can I help? That's holding the calm for somebody. You seem really angry. Is there something I can do to help? What can I do to ease your burden? How can I stop making this hurt so much? Mm -hmm. Imagine you're firing somebody and the person's really upset and you say, how can I make this hurt not so much? For God's sakes, what does that do to the poison? It just drains out. Mm -hmm. So, so much of our pain, our misery, our anguish that leads to tension and conflict and aggression comes from pain and comes from fear. And so but you can't spend 20 years on a shrink's couch to try to, you know, figure all this stuff out. So that's why I wrote this simple, cheap $15 little paperback to say, here, here are some good things you could do right now to take control, to take power. It's really magic, Jen. It's just really magic. I uh, I love the fact that you're leaning into just take a couple of seconds and with just that one phrase, and like you said, repeating it over just a couple of seconds, it really does give you that opportunity that you need to think about, like you said, what do I want to have happen here? Mm -hmm. Because we have choices, right? How we interact with someone in that moment in time, that's going to have an impact. That's going to influence how they respond to us in turn. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I face this all the time as a media analyst you know, we're in a situation, it's kind of a weird situation. We meet over Zoom and we always have uh, a variety of different um, political viewpoints and we read the news and we have to talk about it. And most of the time we all view the news pretty similarly, but as everybody can imagine, you know, <laughs> we're going to get to those few articles that we really need to have a conversation because either the bias is is so apparent or the reliability is so low um, and we don't know where our own blind spots are. So it's really important to be able to have those conversations. But it, like you said, even though we've been doing this for a long time, yeah. uh, I remember one time I was working with another analyst and we started going down the rails a little bit. And I remember the analyst said to me, because I, I said, I, well, let's make sure that we're staying focused on, we're not here to advocate, right? A, a position. We're here to just look at the text and let's see what the text is telling us and then decide whether or not the text itself is biased, reliable. And she said to me, I don't need a lecture. <laughs> just like that. And I had, I did exactly what, what you said to do. I had to kind of back away for a moment and, now, I didn't have the language that you were saying right there, that, that phrase, but I was doing something very similar. And then that gave me just the brief moment I needed to just kind of back away and then back in to think about how do I want to address this in this moment in time? Because it could have easily gone in the wrong direction. And yeah. that's such a critical moment in time yeah. right there to take that moment. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Would you like a quick thing that you can do in that circumstance to totally turn that around? Yes. Yes. Right? So what she, what happens is people take positions based on their identity. So let's say you bring information that shows they're wrong. 98% of people don't go, oh, well, gosh, darn it, I'm wrong. Oh, well, I guess I'll just revamp what I'm thinking. They don't do that. They push and punch harder. 
So when you get something like, well, I didn't need a lecture, I mean, you were, you struck home, yeah, but it wasn't persuasive. Mm. So in that instance, what that person needs, because they're feeling powerless, they're feeling judged, they're feeling stupid, they're feeling wronged or criticized, is the answer is they need validation. Mm. And then in the, my book, I have a ton of sentence stems that you have that are your friend. So what you can say in that situation is, you know what I admire about you? No one says another word. They are wrapped with attention. What are you going to say next? Right? This works at the Thanksgiving table with your idiot uncle. Mm -hmm. This works with your difficult sister-in-law. This works with the coach on your kid's team or the neighbor or your boss or your coworker or a client. It works with everybody. So when someone gets hot and you can feel it starting to get hot, you immediately stop it and you choose your verb. What I admire about you, what I respect about you, what I enjoy about you, what I like about you, what I love about you. And then you say something authentic. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's a hard person. It's really hard for you to validate them. Mm -hmm. You know what you can say? Your dedication, mm -hmm. your distance, your commitment, your clarity, your decision-making, your um, effort. You can say any of those words. So if you pick a couple of them, and those are kind of your go-tos. So they're just mm -hmm. in your mind, put it at a post-it note on your phone, put it in your phone as a post-it note. So when the situation happens and it's hot, like you, you said something and she kind of punched at you. Mm -hmm. You easily could have, if you were emotionally immature, or tired, or cranky, or you could have punched back. Instead, you took a step back. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then the next leaning in piece is this validation. Mm -hmm. And I just described it. That's how you validate people that you don't agree with at all. Yeah. You won't like at all. Hello, doctors. Chip Fitchner here, co-founder of Large Practice Sales and the host of Practice Partnership, monetizing your dental practice. Every month we release new episodes that teach dentists how to enhance their practices, profitability, and build generational wealth by partnering with an invisible dental support organization. The fact is dental consolidation is accelerating. It's coming to your town if it's not there already. So tune in to Practice Partnership to stay on top of what's happening in our industry by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting us at largepracticesales.com. You know, it takes a thousand people to build a building and just one malcontent with a stick of dynamite to ruin it all. Knowing how to reduce conflict and diffuse tension is key to a happy life. And even though it tends to be difficult for most of us, there are some simple tricks and tools that we can learn that will really improve our life today. Hesha Abrams, a world-renowned mediator, negotiator, and author with over 30 years as an expert in resolving conflict, implements innovative approaches and thought-provoking solutions that obtain favorable outcomes for even the most complex matters. Hesha's popular new book, Holding the Calm, shares her secrets of how to read a situation to resolve tension, eliminate conflict, and restore harmony. Get a copy of the book today, available on Amazon. Click on the link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And let me give our listeners one more advanced tip, because I like to do these advanced and not just the basic, like brush your teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, <laughs> I, should, I, mean, I know I should communicate nicely with people. Okay, okay, okay. You know, um, is let's say I have to deal with someone that I despise. Mm. I mean, I despise or I'm frightened of or, and I have to deal with them. It's a client, it's a boss, it's a teacher. It's, I, I can't run away. I'm stuck dealing with them. As long as I look through the filter of how terrible you are, it's going to be very hard for me to do it. So I'm going to look at you and I'm going to ask myself one question. Would you pull my kid out of a burning car? 95% mm -hmm. of the time, the answer to that will be yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I look at you as the person who pulled my kid out of a burning car. Mm -hmm. And if it only gives you a 2% aperture, a 2% opening, 
Fine. Maybe it gives you a 20% opening. Yeah. Fine. That's the place you go into and then do this validation stuff. You will see people literally melt in your hands. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to say, oh, well, my goodness, Jen, you're very good at this holding the calm stuff. They're just going to say, wow, you can just handle anything. Yeah. Wow. You can get along with anyone. Wow. You can just handle problems. Wow. You just get things done. That's what they're going to say. Yeah. Yeah. What if you are in a situation where there is someone and it could be a friend, a family member, a coworker, whoever, and you've known this person for a very long time and you just feel man, they require so much work all the time. Like I'm <laughs> always validating them. Always. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and it just, and, and I don't, those who have listened to me for a very long time, they know I, what I'm about to say next. Empathy, empathy does not come easy for me. I'm just one of those people that I like to just say, let's just get to the bottom of the problem. Okay. Let's just don't worry about the emotions. Let's just solve the problem. And then we can all move on from it. So, you know, like, so yeah. don't get your feelings hurt, damn it. <laughs> and then, and it's, been, it can be exhausting. Working? I was going to say, how's that been working out for you? <laughs> you know, I, I have learned over the years, and this is the funny thing about that. I had someone tell me recently, they were like, Jen, you know, that's just not true. You are one of the most empathetic people that I've, I've ever known. And I just, I had to laugh. I said, you know, what has happened is I've learned that there's a difference between empathic listening and then listening to solve the problem, right? That critical listening. And I've learned to just stay quiet long enough to observe <laughs> and be able to tell, okay, or even ask the person, are you here to vent? In that case, I got you. I will shut up and you can vent away. Or is this something that you're actually looking to have some assistance here? Good and I, that has solved a lot of my problems. But because I've learned to do that, I fooled everyone to think that <laughs> I am I have empathy. <laughs> that was beautifully done, Jen. Exactly correct. <laughs> and you know what I tell people is, for God's sakes, give yourself some grace. You know, human beings are weird. They're difficult. They're challenging. They're also beautiful and magnificent and enriching. It's all of it. It's just all of it. Yeah. And so you got to give yourself some grace that sometimes, you know, your, your time is your wealth. Your, your time and your energy is your wealth. It's like these old women that say, ah, oh, at least you got your health. You know, <laughs> it really is true. Your time, I mean, all you have to say is let somebody get a cancer diagnosis and all mm -hmm. of a sudden time resources are used very differently, you know? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And God knows, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I always think of that poor guy reading his newspaper and his lazy boy in a plane falls out of the sky and hits his mm -hmm. ass, right? <laughs> You just don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so mm -hmm. if someone is too much for you, you are allowed to say, I wish I could help you right now, but I've got another call mm -hmm. or I've got another meeting I've got to go to. But you know what? I believe in you and I believe that you can handle this. Mm -hmm. See that little validation piece and yeah. then escape. escape. You have no obligation yeah. to be people's emotional garbage can. That is not the same as being empathetic. Mm -hmm. So each one of us has to play that balancing game every day with every person in every situation until you kind of get good with this is where I'm going to give and this is where I'm not. I wish I'd given a little more there or I wish I'd given a little less there. Okay. That's called grace. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer. You know, I'm going to be 65 years old this year. And I go, I finally my sixth decade of life. I feel like I finally learned a few things. You know, <laughs> that's, that's one of the big ones is your energy is finite mm -hmm. and spew it around and not have it plant seeds. Not a good use of resources. Mm -hmm. And you are allowed. I give everybody permission, I, uh, ha, 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 you know, to, to marshal and protect your resources and then to use them wisely, Obi-Wan. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess they probably need to be prepared, even if they do it as nicely as possible or, you know, with all the validation in the world. Sometimes you might run across someone who still isn't going to appreciate the fact that you've said now. There you go. 
and your boundaries are your boundaries. Yeah. There you go. But just because you know your emotional immaturity does not become my problem mm-hmm. unless I allow it to become mm-hmm. my problem. And one of the beautiful things about, again, why I call the book Holding the Calm is it creates a moat around your feelings and how you choose to react to the feelings. So literally, I'm seeing my hands, I'm like pushing out mm-hmm. because for so many of us, we feel something, boom, boom, it's right there. And, mm-hmm. and nanosecond in between feeling and reacting. The more you can create space, a moat around what you feel and how you choose to act, the happier, the calmer, the more successful, the more efficient, the more you're going to be. That's mm-hmm. just the reality of it. And I'm human too. Every once in a while, something will happen and I go, God, <sighs> okay, back to my moat. And that's why, again, I keep using that. I, I say it to myself. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm mm-hmm. because it works. You know, like your grandmother would give you a rubber band and tell you to snap your wrist, you know? That's right. <laughs> hurt myself <laughs> you know that hurts when you snap yourself <laughs> I'm, I'm already suffering enough <laughs> right <laughs> why do I want to exacerbate this <laughs> so true oh th- I mean such valuable advice here um so as a mediator, are you working more with individuals one-on-one or are you going into organizations and you're helping organizations figure out, you know, how to manage their conflict more effectively? Um, um, how, are you, how are you going out there and spreading the good word? Thank you. I, I've been, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, so I have done every possible kind of case. Now I tend to do very large, very complex, very difficult cases usually between companies or inventors, uh, that kind of stuff, where it's usually very complicated and very involved because it's Mm -hmm. more complicated. It's more fun to me, you know, Mm -hmm. being able to figure it out. But I'll tell you, the big CEO of a huge Fortune 100 company is the same guy or gal as somebody who the neighbor drove over your roses and you're pissed Mm -hmm. off. I mean, exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And has the same late at night, you know what they're talking to me about? Ugh, their kid's lacrosse coach is such an idiot and won't give the kid playtime and what can they do so it seems like such a normal conversation to have and and a lot of people i guess don't view ceos of fortune 100 companies in that light exactly the same or their ex-wife you know or it's just human beings and bumper car emotions and you know look at our world now we've got people you know with guns shooting the place mm-hmm. up mm-hmm. so you get okay no guns and then you get people saying wait 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 don't take away my guns there's no discussion in that gulf. The real gulf is how do we keep people safer and how do we off gas anger and diffusing of tension because we have a lot of it in our society. And it's very hard because everyone is labeled in our society. You, yeah. you are part of this club or you're part of that club. And the clubs actually have flags. They've got colors. They've got secret words. And so it doesn't really rem- matter even what the content is. It's well, I have to believe this. I'm part of that club. And nobody thinks that way, but no one wants to be excommunicated from the club. Right. And so you join in with whatever that belief system is. And so mm-hmm. talking to people about content is just like a waste of time. You know, yeah. I have a whole chapter in the book that I call creating small winnable victories, mm-hmm. because if you tackle, I mean, just think of abortion. It's a mm-hmm. uh, you know, baby killer right to my body. That's right. Where, where, where is there? There's, there's no in between. <laughs> and so creating small winnable victories with a group of people mm-hmm. is, you know, chapter one of the book is speak into the ears that are hearing you. So just as an example to our listeners, if you're talking to an introvert, would you speak the same way to an extrovert? Mm-hmm. We all kind of say, oh, no, of course I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. But yet we do. We talk our way. We do our thing. Mm -hmm. There's a famous behavioralist named Maslow who said that if all you have is a hammer, all you will see are nails. That's right. And so it's a big thing to be able to say, okay, I'm an extrovert. I'm an introvert. This is how I talk. So in order for me to talk to you, I have to take three seconds to actually look at you. Mm -hmm. It's like a bomb detector in the town square. He waddles out in his Michelin suit. He doesn't just start cutting junk. He looks, (laughs) he diagnoses. What is the situation? It's the same thing 
when you're in any kind of a difficult conversation, tense conversation, or one that has the potential to be that way. Mm -hmm. Take a minute to speak into the ears that are hearing you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a vegetarian, I'm not going to talk to you about steak. Right. Oh, and if you're a big steak eater, I'm not going to talk to you about, you know, plants. And it's not, I mean, I'm doing the basic stuff, but this is not hard. People can just master this Mm -hmm. dramatic, dramatic, dramatic improvement. And then Mm -hmm. you're fine tuning more and more and more and more and more and more advanced stuff. But even the basic stuff, remember, fork, knife, chopsticks. Do you, since you have been in this field for 30 plus years now, have you witnessed in society, or I guess even in between just individuals, those who are within our society, is there, has there been um, a decline in individuals' ability to engage in civil discussion? It, it just, I don't know, it, it, we have conversations all the time, you know, in, in the groups that I'm in, and we we love to lament about communication today, you know, <laughs> and everybody has the, you know, we have, no longer we can't even talk to anybody here. Uh, so what have you observed, you know, over the past, uh, since you have actually been actively engaged in, in this field of conflict resolution and, and management, are, are we seeing it correctly? I mean, has it gotten worse or are we just more aware of it now than we used to be? So I'm going to say something a little controversial because awesome. I've been doing this a long time. I don't think it's any worse. Yeah, I think people never really have the ability to talk to each other because we don't teach this in schools. Mm. And you talk like your mama and daddy talked mm-hmm. or your grandma, and that's what you get. What we are getting now, though, is less uh, civility. Mm. That we still can't talk to each other, so can't listen to another perspective, another point of view. Mm-hmm. But what we've lost is the ability to, oh, we can agree to disagree. Yeah. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, Jen, I just think you're wrong mm-hmm. versus Jen, I'm going to punch you in the face because you're wrong. So it's, right. the, it's the intensity that has yeah. happened, and neuroscientists call this a standardization of deviance. Mm-hmm. So, Just to give a quick example, my husband's an airline pilot and was a Czech airman with American Airlines. And he told me that, uh, you know, a few decades ago, airplanes would get damaged all the time. The luggage carts, the beverage carts, you know, some guy wasn't paying attention and they'd whack the plane. Well, you can't take off then. And all the people have to deplane. You got to fix it. It's a big deal. So they did a rule and they said, 10 feet away. Everyone has to stay 10 feet away from a plane. People don't know what 10 feet is. So finally, they took a paint, you know, sort of like you do a dead body on the sidewalk. (laughs) They did the shape of the plane 10 feet away from the plane. And guess Mm. what? All the accidents dropped down to almost zero. Yeah. It was amazing. But then what happened after a couple of years? Joe is used to park in his cart right on the edge of the yellow line. He's a little lazy today and doesn't want to have to carry the stuff as far. So he goes in a foot. Well, Steve sees him do it. It's not a big deal. The line doesn't really matter that much, right? And he goes in a foot. And before you know it, that's called the standardization of deviance. When the boundary is not respected, when the line is not enforced, boom, 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 the line meant nothing anymore. And they started mm-hmm. the planes again. So, you know, in countries that they don't give out traffic tickets for people running red lights, you've got horrible fatalities. Mm-hmm. Our country will, you know, no one likes getting a ticket or getting stopped by a police officer, but he or she's honestly saving your life by doing that because they're enforcing the lines. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what's happened in our country with lack of civil discourse between social media, uh, the talking heads screaming and yelling at each other. You know, the newspaper saying, if it bleeds, it leads. So we no longer can have nice conversations and be satisfied with it. Now there has to be intensity and drama and, you know, that and that is really. So my big thing to people is let's just tone it down. Mm -hmm. We can still completely disagree and Mm -hmm. think about things differently, but let's tone it down and, you know, go get a, go get a coffee together. Right. Mm -hmm. And the more we can do that as individuals in my little sphere of influence, I'm doing this in your mm-hmm. little 
sphere of influence, you're doing that. I would ask everyone to listen here. Take a moment now and think, what is your sphere of influence? And in that, whatever sphere of influence you've got, you just say, I'm, I'm taking a stand for civility. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm doing. I'm not going to label. I'm going to say, I dis- I, we agree to disagree on that, but I still like you as a person. Mm-hmm. It was amazing what will happen. People will talk to you more. They will listen to you more. More will get done. And you'll get less agitated and aggravated, which, you know, let's let's talk about having a happy and good life requires not getting agitated all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't agree with you more. It, one of the things that I really appreciate about that is sometimes we are going to have to agree to disagree. I mean, at the end of the day, the reality is if I have this belief system and you have that belief system, the likelihood of us convincing the other one to completely agree with us is I mean, it's, it's not very high that that's going to happen. And, and I have been, it, it, I find it personally frustrating, you know, especially social media. I have to limit the amount of, I'm exposing myself to social media because the, the number of people who don't agree with that, you know, the, the whole agree to disagree thing is not something that they think is, is legitimate. You know, no, you you, you have to agree with me on this and I'm going to beat you down, you know, and, and until you acquiesce to whatever it is that, you know, I believe. And, and um, that is so completely exhausting. And it's like, you're beating your head up against a brick wall. Like, why are you doing that to yourself? Why are you doing it to the other person? But why are you doing that to yourself to right. begin with? Try the validation sentence them in those situations. Cause even if you can't convince them or stop it, you'll feel better about yourself. Mm-hmm. And what will happen is your sphere of influence will increase a little bit. Yeah. Because other people will notice and they'll say, you handled that really well. That was, yeah. that was, yeah. you know good. what I admire about you, your dedication. Yeah. You know what I respect about <laughs> you, your commitment, your commitment, you know, but you know, it's, it's not hard to do. And it, it yeah. stops people in their tracks because very often when people are spouting off, what they're really saying is I'm a very insecure little person and I need to feel important or I need to feel valued and listen to me. Right. Okay. Okay. And you'll see people when you do that, often they'll walk back the position. Well, that's mm-hmm. not the way I meant it. Mm-hmm. I want to think it's not that much. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, I mean, it's very, people think about wars. Wars are rarely actually over. People want to keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting. Mm-hmm. It's so rare for someone to go, when they go to court, they keep doing appeals and appeals and appeals. It's not like, okay, you lost. Yeah. Sore loser. Like, you're done. Win or lose. I mean, our justice system is designed for at some point, the file's got to be closed. That's right. Win or lose, it's done. And yet, you know, we just keep the fight going because of the identity of the person. And so mm-hmm. that's one of the things I like to talk about in the book. I have lots of stories in the book and they're all battle tested. And what I tell people is I can give you words. Mm-hmm. You won't remember a doggone thing I said. I give you stories, mm-hmm. I give you analogies. You'll walk away and go, you know what? How does that apply to my life? And what did that do? You know, like I just thought of one that's not in the book. Should I tell you now and help our, help our listeners have a little bonus? Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I heard this yes, please. If you've read my book, Cracking the Rich Code, you know it is chock full of fantastic advice from top thought leaders and super successful entrepreneurs from around the world. How would you like to be a member of an exclusive community that provides that same how-to content from those same leaders? What if you were able to attend member-only live events and interact with them? I'd like to invite you to join the Rich Code Club. It will change the way you think about yourself, your money, and your life. It's the only social media platform purely focused on helping you grow. Join the Rich Code Club today for free by clicking on the link in the show notes. (laughs) I heard this on NPR um, Hidden Brain. Mm. And uh, it was after the book was Great already yeah. in, in, being published. 
<laughs> but I just thought how brilliant it brings this point home. So there's a company that would sell twenty and thirty thousand dollar couches. They were bespoke, customized. You could make them any length you wanted. The pick, the piping, and the fabric, and the this and the that, and do do do, and fancy, 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 right? And you would design all this stuff online. People would get all the way to the point of sale, and a huge percentage would not complete the sale. Mm-hmm. Well, the company was Flamox because these are people clearly that could afford it and had invested time and energy in designing it. Why aren't they completing the doggone sale? So what do people do? You have a car. You either have gas or you have a brake. 95% of us put on the gas. I'm going to talk more. I'm going to persuade more. I'm going to do more. I'm going to convince more. I'm going to give more. So here, more sales, more promotion, more advertising. Pshaw, didn't change a doggone thing. So finally, they they put the brakes on and they hired somebody to contact all the people at the point of sale who didn't complete the sale and chat and be nice and lovely with them and then say, do you mind if I ask why you didn't complete the sale? The number one overwhelming reason why people that could afford a $20,000 couch didn't complete the sale, bada boom, bada bang. They didn't know what to do with the old couch. Isn't that ridiculous? So obviously the solution is so easy now. We'll take away your old one, give you a tax. When we bring you the new one, it just had never dawned on anybody. And so I guarantee all of our listeners that if you think of a couple of people that you're in some conflict with now or that you just don't want to deal with, there is a barrier there that you have not discovered. And if you go into it trying to uncover the barrier instead of trying to persuade or convince, the problem just kind of goes away or they agree, or sometimes they think it was their idea and they agreed and you still get what you want anyway. Who cares? You know, you you decide on the definition of a win for you when you go into it. Mm -hmm. But I love that story. You know, my book, I've got tons of stories and so if you're flamoxed, if you're at a point where, Jen, we're, I can't even talk to you. I, I, we see the world so differently and you're not willing to listen to anything. I, I'm not sure what to say to you. Stop talking. Give them a story. Yeah. Just say, you know what? That reminds me of a story. Or I read, a, I read this in Holding the Calm, this cool book. Mm-hmm. And what I tell people is take my stories. They are everyone I put in there is designed to be told in less than a minute. And it's been battle tested by me in real live conflict situations. And it had to work at least 10 or 15 times before I put it in the book. So every single one of them works. (laughs) Take one of my stories. They have been researched. (laughs) Use them because you're more likely to go, tell me a story. First of all, you get a break from me haranguing you and Mm -hmm. telling basically how wrong you are and how right I am. Yeah. Now we, we are together listening to a story. And then you take away from it, whatever you choose to take away from it. Mm -hmm. It's a terrific technique. And I have used it with, you know, truck drivers to CEOs Mm -hmm. and everything in between, because it's the, it's a human experience. We talk about all this diversity, equity, inclusion stuff, which yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we need to do it. It's all important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to go below that. I don't want to talk to someone as a black woman or a white man or a Hispanic female, like what? That's your outside. Yeah. I'm much more interested in your inside. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Do you are you a thinking person versus a feeling person? Are you a big picture person or are you a detail person? Mm-hmm. Are you a rebel renegade who doesn't follow rules or are you a person that only follows rules? Mm-hmm. That's like easy stuff. People will self reveal that to you so easy in the first ten minutes of talking. Okay, so if I'm dealing with the rebel rouser, I'm not going to talk about these are the rules. And if I'm talking with a rule follower, I'm not going to go, ah, throw the rule book away. Yeah. Go with your gut, right? It, and it's not hard once you train your brain to think like that. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting that you said that. Um, I was telling a friend the other day that I was going to have you on the show and we were going to talk about conflict management. And of course, whenever you talk to anybody about, oh, I'm going to talk to so-and-so about conflict management, they always get really excited because they already have something in mind, you know, that that they're really interested in, in connection to this topic. 
And one of the things that I like to talk about when um, I work with groups on communication skills is it's something very similar. I talk about how to um, identify different communication styles so that you can adapt to others' communication style rather than trying to force them to be like you, figure their style out so that you can adapt to them. And it's going to take you a lot farther, you know, in the, in the conversations that you have with them. And, you know, I will be asked the question all the time, well, what about the differences between men and women and (laughs) how they communicate? And one thing that, one thing that I have found in focusing on the communication style is it takes that away. Yeah. You know, and they're really, in that sense, there really are no differences in how men and women communicate when you're talking about the actual communication style itself. If exactly. you're just focusing on that rather than focusing on, you know, if they're a man or if they're a woman. Yeah. Um, it, it, what do you what do you say to that in in the conflict management arena? Do, do you view that similarly or do you have a different take on that? No, I agree with you totally. And I, I laugh yeah. out loud because when someone says, how do you deal, how do you talk to men or how do you negotiate with men? What you're really saying to me is your skill set is very limited in that area mm-hmm. because you look at all women or all mm-hmm. men as this giant amorphous mass. Yes. It's almost like saying, how do I talk to Asians? Yeah, <laughs> right. How like like if you were to say that out loud, there would be the the audible gasp. Yes, it sounds, <laughs> no, no. But let's make it like even real. You know, well, how do I talk to black people? Right. Doesn't it sound right. ridiculous? It sounds ridiculous. It is. It is. And so what I tell people is everything you just said, you just, you go, you, I told me chapter one of the book, speak into the ears that are hearing you. It requires me to look at you, to mm-hmm. listen to you, to see who you are as a person. And you know, the ancillary benefit of that is you feel like I care. Mm-hmm. So I give a darn meter isn't broken. Mm-hmm. So when someone feels like their give a darn meter isn't broken, I'm more likely to want to engage with you mm-hmm. and talk to you because you seem to kind of care about mm-hmm. me as a person. And, you know, think about it. Most people are in relationships that don't work for them. They wear clothes that are uncomfortable. Uh, they live in places they don't like or with people they don't like. They have jobs they don't like. That's the vast, vast majority of people. Mm-hmm. So in the moment of time, again, I talked about the sphere of influence. This is mm-hmm. sort of like a vortex of energy. You are in that place with that person. One, you're safe. You're validating. You're listening. You're curious. You're engaged. It, it's like I have a chapter in the book I call giving a dozen roses. And that's what we're talking about here. It's like you gave somebody a dozen roses. And what did it take me to do? Mm-hmm. Minute of my time just because I had to think like that. And so, you know, what people want, and people will ask the same question to me too, you know, they want a magic pill. How do you, you know, give me, give me the sentence to use to talk to all women. There you go. And I'm going to say, well, it's not that one. That's right. As a matter of fact, there are none of these <laughs> out of all these options, zero of them are going to work. People want that, you know, and I want to say, look, cho- I want chocolate cake to not be fattening. You right. Know, and Brussels sprouts to be, to be, and it's like, it's just what it is. So the question, again, that's why I use the fork spoon chopsticks thing. I mean, you can eat with a fork like this, stabbing it. I mean, you, you can, it works. I'd rather hold the fork properly. Okay. Mm-hmm. But that's your level of choice. So if you want to be the kind of person who takes food and shoves it in your mouth, God bless, go right ahead. If you want to stab it with your fork, if you want to eat soup with your fork, Okay. That's your choice. Or here's reading glasses. You're not seeing so well. Can can I put a pair of reading glasses on your eyes so you get to go, oh, that's better. And that's what I tell people. You don't limit yourself into how do I talk to this person? You learn how to be a bomb detector or a doctor. And uh, I look at you and I've got one more analogy just because that's what people remember when they listen to us. your tummy hurts. You go into the ER and you go, right? Most of us go, oh, gross. I don't want to look at that. Not the ER doc. She looks at it. Mm -hmm. Smell like it should smell. Are there pills in there? Is there metal? 
Is her undigested food? It's a diagnostic for her. Mm -hmm. So when people have emotional blah, that's just vomit. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And so if you can look at it as a diagnostic tool, people are really not that complicated. They mm -hmm. really aren't. They will self-reveal very quickly and very clearly. And then you can go, oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Someone's really angry. I tell you, that person who's really angry has fear underneath. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you can get to it. Maybe you can't. Your job is not to be a shrink. But my job is to not let that blow me out of the water. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I look at you, this my boss going at me like this, and I look at you as just a scared little boy in his underwear, mm -hmm. takes away a lot of the power right? And so now I can make choices and then say, instead of saying, what are you afraid of? Which is really accusatory. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the biggest concern to you? Mm -hmm. Think of the couch story. What's the barrier in your way of, of wanting to try that? And then people will end up telling you things that you didn't know. And then you'll get to go, oh, yeah, well, makes sense to me. Oh well, yeah. Maybe there's not a solution to that. Or you know, I do have an idea that might be a solution to that. Mm -hmm. Now, look what's also happened from a neuroscience point of view. You and I have created a subtle little team building. Mm -hmm. A chapter in the book where I talk about the benefit of plural pronouns mm -hmm. and we instead of I or you. Yes. We can do this. We will look into this. It literally psychologically just works with people. And, um, this stuff is just magic. And when you can play with it, that's why I, I insisted with my publisher, it'd be a simple paperback. I wanted it inexpensive. I put a um, discussion guide in the back so that if you know 15 people in an organization want to buy it and then have lunch and go over the discussion questions in the back, they can get continuing education credit or training credit or whatever they do. And then you don't need to hire some big fancy trainer to come in and do it for you. You can discuss it with yourselves because what will happen is we're talking and Jen, you'll say, well, I thought that story was stupid. <laughs> really? I found it very impactful. And then you're going to say, really? Tell me more. Mm -hmm. Now that's how real training happens. It doesn't happen because I stand on a podium and, you know, do entertainment, which is still valuable in its own right, of course. But the real training is in that small group stuff with people saying, really, why would you think mm -hmm. like that? Huh. Isn't that interesting? And the questions track the book. So it's simple. It's easy because I want people to get better at this in their home lives, with their kids, with their bosses, at work, with their neighbors. So that standardization of deviance thing I was talking about, we can take the civility and pop it out another foot or two. Yeah. You know, and then that's the standard by which we talk. Mm -hmm. We talk hateful talk. We don't talk accusatory talk. We can say, you know, let's say someone's spouting hard at me. I can say, okay, I hear you. And I hear how strongly and how passionately you believe that. Mm -hmm. Do you think I might have a different opinion? Yeah. That stops people in their tracks. Huh? What? Well, no reasonable person could. Do you think I'm a reasonable person? Now, all of a sudden, they stop and they they listen. Oh, this is, you know, 80% of the time. I don't worry about the 10 or 20% crazy because that's beyond the scope of what we can do here. That requires real professionals. And, you know, I, I do that in my real professional world. But 80% mm -hmm. of the time, this is going to work. I'm going to call that good. That's right. Yeah. Leading with questions. That's what I'm hearing over and over again, the leading with questions. And that really does open up a whole world for that conversation to be able to take place. Mm -hmm. um, I just really love that. That is absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm telling you, listeners, I told you, keep your notebook out. You're going to learn so much in this conversation. I have learned so much in this conversation. I've really enjoyed this. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I can't believe we've already been speaking for over 50 minutes. So we're coming up on the hour here really quick. Um, but before we wrap things up, I wanted to ask you, is, is there anything that you didn't have an opportunity to touch on, you know, in, out of the conversation that we've had thus far that you would really like the listeners to be able to hear? 
you know, you were asked so many good questions. I feel like we talked about a lot of things that so was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would tell people is I have a webpage, holdingthecalm.com, and I don't sell the email list to anybody. So you can sign up. And then I come up with cool stuff all the time. And as I'm coming up with cool stuff, I just send out emails to, you know, to my folks, you know, because people are trying to do this better. And if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, Hesha Abrams, I post all the time and I do little one minute videos and the benefit of the one minute videos is you can email it to somebody. Mm -hmm. I think you may, I mean, let's say to somebody who's difficult and you're having a challenge with, instead of saying, my God, you're difficult. You can say, <laughs> Oh, I just saw this one minute video on this topic. I thought it was interesting. And then you mm -hmm. forward it on over to them. So there's a lot of subtle ways to be able to do that. So LinkedIn, I've got a Facebook page and on my holding the comm site, because I'm really, and I would and I would ask our listeners as a favor to me, if you do buy the book, I mean, you can get it anywhere, you know, Barnes and Noble, uh, Books a Million, Walmart. But Amazon, of course, is the big dog in that fight mm -hmm. uh, to leave a good review because that helps the search algorithm, because the more people we can get to be reading this and talking about it, maybe we can actually take back our society and create more civility. And at least you, dear listener within your sphere of influence and Jen does it within her sphere of influence and I do it within mine. We're like little cells of a body getting healthier and healthier and healthier. And I really do believe that um, we can make an impact. I really do. That's fantastic. I will make sure that all of that information is in the show notes for the listeners. Make sure that you connect with Hesha online through her social media platforms, buy the book, wherever you want to get your book, just Make sure you get the book. And I agree, make sure that you leave, um, you know, just, just leave something on Amazon if you decide to buy it on Amazon. Let everybody know how it worked and, and how wonderful it was. You know, I, I know as an author myself, greatly appreciate, you know, having those reviews out there. So um, that I, let's let's do that for Hesha because I, I think this is absolutely wonderful. And um, thank you so much for oh, being on the show and, and just sharing with us, uh, everything that you, you know, experience within this realm and, and giving us some tidbits, those golden nuggets of information out of your book. I know somebody out there is listening to this and they're going to try, just like you said, experiment with it. You know, this is a skill just like any other skill. We got to work at it to get good at it. So experiment with it and then uh, report back to us. Let us know how it goes <laughs> because it. I'm, I'm really curious. I love it. That. Yeah. I love yeah. it. That's great. All right. Well, Thank everyone, you. have a great rest of your day. And uh, I hope you all will just keep working at it. The, this thing we call life and, and the conversations we have, it ain't easy. So we'll just keep plugging away at it. All right, Hesha, thanks again. Everybody take care. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review.